Our keynote speaker is going to challenge our audience to think about how we as a sector need to take action to address a growing health crisis here at home. While it affects all of us, the impacts are being witnessed most clearly by the Indigenous peoples of the Arctic. Climate change affects every single person here. We're all connected through climate, but climate change does not affect us all equally. Here in what we now call Canada, the Inuit have noticed changes in the patterns of the weather, the sea ice, and the land. Traditional hunting and fishing grounds are no longer accessible or abundant. Traditional ways of knowing are endangered. Sheila Watt Cloutier is a witness to these changes. She has seen their effects on the health of individuals and communities, and she has observed how they have added to the anxiety felt by people who already have a historical context of trauma. Sheila was born in the far north and raised traditionally on the land until the age of 10. At university, she studied counseling, education, and human development before returning to the far north and working as an Inuktitut interpreter for the Ungava Hospital in Nunavik. These experiences led her to a lifetime commitment to improving health conditions and education in Aboriginal communities. Sheila is recognized as a leader in the fight for ecological justice for Arctic peoples. She has served as Canadian President of the Inuit Circumpolar Council, where she was spokesperson for Arctic Indigenous peoples in the negotiation of the Stockholm Convention, which banned the manufacture and use of certain chemicals which poison the Arctic food chain. In 2007, she testified at the Inter-American Commission on Human Rights' first hearing on climate change and human rights. She's also received numerous honours and awards, as you can see on the screen. In 2015, Sheila published The Right to be Cold, a best-selling memoir about the effects of climate change on Inuit communities, which she has witnessed personally. The book explores the parallels between safeguarding the Arctic and the survival of Inuit culture. Among other things, Sheila teaches us that we need to humanize the issue of climate change. She notes that, quote, the changes that Inuit and Indigenous peoples observe provide warning and wisdom for the rest of humanity. It is my honour to welcome Sheila Watt Cloutier to the stage this afternoon. She comes with us, she comes to us with a call to action for our sector to support communities affected by climate change. And after Sheila speaks, we'll have a about 10 minutes for quick questions and answers uh, at, the, at the mics, and uh, Sheila will also be available after that to talk with people who are interested. Welcome, Sheila. If I may, I'm going to remove whatever these are. Can I put this down a little bit here? Yes? I'm not as tall as Kate. Good to be here this morning. Ullakut means uh, good morning in Inuktitut, in my mother tongue. So, uh, wonderful to be here. First, I'd like to acknowledge that I speak on the traditional lands of the Algonquin and I'm honored to be here doing so. And in Ottawa, where I also did some of my high school here, so I was uh, sent away at the age of 10 for school. Uh, two years of that was in uh, Nova Scotia, three years at residential school in Churchill, Manitoba, and three years here in Ottawa. So I'm familiar with uh, the Ottawa setting here. So wonderful to be here, and thank you, first of all, to Kate Mulligan, and to Scott Wolf, uh, who are behind uh, me being here in front of you today to speak to you and bring to you the Arctic, my beloved homeland. And I bring pictures as well of the landscape, the ice scape, and the human faces to these issues as I try to humanize the issue that is so often just seen as um, a political issue or an economic issue, a scientific issue. 
um, and, and it's been a daunting task, I must say. So, yes, to bring you that, because for us, climate change is really about uh, health and our culture and the protection of that, and that's been my life's journey. And I want to say how impressed I was. I was at the, the gala last night for a part of the time, how impressed I am of the work that you're all doing in terms of the health issues uh, of our country, of this province. And congratulations to all those who won those remarkable awards last night and to the Indigenous uh, peoples who won this award this morning. Congratulations. All very impressive and, um, and really grounding for, for many of us. So Inuit culture is based on the ice, the snow, and, and the cold. And its very foundation, in fact, depends on the weather and climate being cold, like freezing cold. And so all living things, including our animals and the way that we hunt our animals, thrive on that cold. That's just how it is. And that's how we, we have been living for millennia. So when climate change starts to happen, and the changes that are happening, the warming, it creates that imbalance to the cycle of the nature in a, where we live. And all living things are really impacted by the warming that is happening up there. And for us, you have to understand that the ice, the snow, and the cold is about transportation and mobility. And as soon as that starts to go, then of course it becomes an issue of safety and security. And so it becomes very precarious. And so our right to culture, our right to health, our right to educate our children on that land and ice, and our right to safety, and our right to all the rights that are already um, supported and protected it by law are minimized or destroyed as a result of that. So we have to be reminded sometimes, and I know that my fellow indigenous peoples in the room, and by the way, um, I honor the elders that are here as well, because I know they were at the gala last night. I assume they're still here today. Sometimes we do need to be reminded that in our world, in the Inuit world, and other indigenous peoples, of course, we were highly once very independent. We had our own systems in place, our own education systems, our own justice, health, and social systems that were very much based on indigenous knowledge and wisdom. And we prepared our young people for the challenges uh, and opportunities of life in a very holistic way. And these changes happened very quickly. I mean, even in my lifetime, I traveled only by dog team the first 10 years of my life and learned English, started to learn English only when I was six years of age. And so you can imagine we were not able to have the full control over all of these changes and that resulted in the, a lot of the stressors that began to impact our way of life on so many levels. And so I believe the root of the challenges uh, from these traumas, from the historical traumas, as well as all of these dependencies that started to grow uh, as a result of these changes, really are um, the root of the problems that we face. And so the dependency problems that we have this, uh, to substances, whether it's to substances, institutions, or processes, really started to erode our sense of identity and our sense of self-worth and lessen our ability to think for ourselves. So these, in turn, have translated into the monumental health and social problems that we're facing today as, or, as northern peoples, and which really all too often are misunderstood as being our inability to adapt to the modern world, which couldn't be further from the truth. We're probably one of the most adaptable people in the world in the, in the kind of harsh environments that we live in. So Canadian history is not well known in those contexts, nor around the world, and it doesn't serve us uh, very well on many fronts. So the social, health, and judicial challenges that we face are not from yesterday, and there is certainly a context to them. And the historical traumas that many people don't know about, uh, for us as northern peoples, the forced relocations into the high Arctic in the name of sovereignty, which happened in the 60s, 50s and 60s. Children sent far away to be educated by strangers. I was one of them. Sexual abuse by those in authority. The collapse of the sustainable sealing market by emotionally driven animal rights activists. The dog slaughters which very few people know about that happened in the 60s. 
residential schools. We all know what that is. Are they are the major factors contributing to the problems that we face today. So we have to understand and realize that the substance abuse, the health problems, and the suicides are not our natural states of our people, but rather a result of these historical traumas, the rapid changes, and of course the creation of institutional dependencies, which still exist today. But through it all, we've had our land and our predictable environment and our climate to help us through the wisdom of our hunters and our elders. <clears throat> and it helped us to adapt at all those levels. However, things are not so predictable today. Things are changing very rapidly. And so many of our elders and hunters will say, this is what I'm teaching you today in order to be a proficient provider and to bring home the, the remarkable food that we rely on. However, they say there's a disclaimer, now that there's climate changes happening so quickly, it can't always be the case. So you have to be even more vigilant and cautious as you go out there on the land and the ice. So I see the strong connection between <clears throat> health and social well-being of our communities and our environment and maintaining an Arctic environment. Um, it is much more than just an environmental concern. It really is an issue of our very right and our ability to exist as, in, as Indigenous people. And that very right and all those rights are being challenged and minimized by the new unpredictability of our climate. I was once asked why I spend so much time on environmental issues when we have so many social and health problems in our communities. And my immediate response was, but I don't see a disconnect between any of these issues. They're all very, very interconnected. So if hunting becomes, if, if hunting continues to decline due to the climate changes, it means that we're going, we're already seeing this, an increase uh, on our already too heavily reliance on very expensive imported food and goods from the South. I mean, it's twice, if not three times the price the cost of living up there and the cost of food. Uh, and if you could see the, the, the cost of the groceries that we spend up in the Arctic, it's just horrifically high. And already we know that the switch away from our diet of country food has led to dramatic increases in diabetes, in childhood obesity, heart disease amongst our people. And as well, this, this reliance on very expensive um, support that we're, or, or that expensive imports only deepens that kind of reliance that we have on uh, government. And that's kind of moving, that's moving away from the, th the kind of building of the, the, the thriving local economies that we really want to create that heavily incorporate the wonderful elements of our traditional culture. So more and more of the much needed life skills of our youth are being lost in fact. And so the fact that life and character skills are taught on the land and the ice are not well, well understood by southern societies. In fact, a hunting culture is not just about going out and harvesting our animals, although that's really an important part of being healthy for us, our organic food, very highly nutritious. But a hunting culture also teaches the skills, such as patience, when you're out there, waiting for that snow to fall, the ice to form, the winds to, to die down, the animals to surface, you are really being taught patience. You are being taught how to be courageous and bold at the right time, survival-based risks that you have to take, but it teaches you about yourself. It really teaches you how to persevere and not give up until you have brought something home to your family. You are taught to be persistent and not give up. You're taught how not to be impulsive. One of the things that we've discovered is that suicide is a very impulsive act. But it's not to say that you're not in a dark place and you need support and guidance and help as you pull yourself out of those dark places. But if you've learned to integrate that being impulsive out on the land doesn't serve you well or your family well, you, when times of stress, when you're in the modern world, it does help you when you've integrated that in a traditional way. 
And so how to be bold under pressure, not to give up, how to be focused, and how to become natural conservationists, and ultimately what it's about, and it's the hallmark of Inuit culture, and I'm sure other indigenous cultures here recognize this as well, is that it's how we develop sound judgment, and ultimately wisdom, silatunik, we call that in my language. And so these skills are very transferable to the modern world. In fact, they're a necessity, especially in times of rapid changes and living in the context of trauma. And so remember, it is the stressors and the traumas of the first wave of tumultuous change, which we have been trying to cope with <clears throat> and often is not well understood in terms of how that translates into what we witness today at the social and health challenges that we're faced with. And the more unexpected, unpredictable stressors, thank you, Kate, I'm a little under the weather these days, so pardon me. <clears throat> so the more unexpected, uh, unpredictable stressors that do happen with these climatic changes, and of course now the influx of extractive industries that are coming in to now exploit the riches which lie beneath that melting ice will only add to the already stressed situations that we are grappling with in our communities. We deal with the depletion of the ozone layer which causes health challenges and over the years more and more of our hunters have developed cataracts as a result of that and skin conditions as well from the higher levels of UV radiation. And remember, we've had to deal with the toxins issue in the 80s when we discovered we were being poisoned from afar and the nursing milk of our mothers and the blood cord were in higher levels than anywhere else. We became the net recipients of toxins that were coming through the weather patterns. And so we were being poisoned from afar and we mobilized ourselves over a course of a period of time. And then we were involved in the UN negotiations on the POPs. And it was very difficult to try to shift this story, this what people considered a chemical story, to one of human health. And it was first and foremost a health issue and challenge for us. So it's not an easy task to try to get the world to understand these issues for us in the Arctic, whether it's the POPs issue or whether it's the um, climate change issues, that this is really about our people. The world has come to know the Arctic more for its wildlife than its people. And oftentimes it's the big companies, you know, the, the Coca-Cola polar bears and seals frolicking around drinking pop on the ice, which is a very unlikely partnership. Because <laughs> one is lunch, right? And, uh, but it works, it markets, it's sexy, it's romantic, and that's what people do is romanticize the Arctic. And so the people get lost. It's just the wildlife that people focus on protecting or promoting in some way for marketing their big products. And so here we are. We had to um, put the human face, and more than that, the human face to the issue of climate change. And after two years of preparation, we were able to uh, launch a legal petition to the Inter-American Commission on Human Rights. And I, along with 62 Inuit uh, signatories from Canada and Alaska, launched the pioneering work on connecting climate change to human rights. And again, to really humanize it in, in a way that hadn't been legally done before. Uh, they chose not to move forward with the legal petition, but I think we helped to change the discourse, the language on this issue, from that, just that political or economic language that is often used. In the end, the Commission chose not to go forward with the petition. There were lots of things going on then with the Bush administration. We thought those were challenges in those days, didn't we? <laughs> I, I, I dare not go down that road. I don't want to spend my, my energy and focus on what's happening south of the border here. Um, so we carry on and we continue to work very hard on trying to, to, to educate 
uh, all of these issue areas. And then the outgrowth, so of that, have been very helpful because I think it allowed people to not only see the connection, but also to start to stand up for their rights as well. And so I think the UN now, even, you know, the first five years, everybody was kind of saying, uh, what is that climate change and human rights? What is that violation of human rights of Inuit of the Arctic? Because most people have come to understand the violation of human rights in terms of individual rights or torture and all of those awful things that go on in the world, but not really understanding that collective rights of an entire people could also be violated. And so there's been changes to the language of the UN as well in, uh, since that time. And the Inter-American Commission on Human Rights Court also added that kind of language. So I think we were able to be effective in changing the discourse on this, even though our own legal petition didn't move forward with the Inter-American Commission, although I testified there with my legal team. So in the rumble tumble of international politics, uh, the language of economics and technology always calls for further delay and always says, you know, we need to be more certain about situations. But, you know, focusing only on the economics and the politics of the issue tends to silo and separate things, uh, issues from one another as, opposing, as opposed to con uh, making the connection, to recognizing those connections between rights, environment, health, economies, and society. So I believe that framing our stories in terms of connections between fundamental human rights, including our right to health, and environmental change refocuses that debate on human, my favorite picture. <laughs> this is our greatest picture of our right to be cold. We just love it. Uh, refocuses that debate on humanity and not just efficiency. And so we have to remember, I think, and we must remember, the doctrine of collective human rights unites our indigenous world uh, to diverse cultures, peoples, and countries all around the world. And I think this important understanding of our collective connection as a shared humanity can spur decision makers to act in a way that no dry uh, technical report ever can. And so ultimately, I think addressing all of these issues um, the environmental degradation of indigenous lands, including climate change, in the language of human rights, and building those human rights protections into our global climate agreements are more than just strategic choices, of course. They are ethical imperatives that demand the world take that principled path and courageously reconnect to solve these huge monumental challenges that we're facing in this world today. So we know the Arctic is, is of utmost importance in the minds of, of many, whether they're policy makers, whether they're economic decision makers and researchers, but again, it needs to be informed by the awareness of what is happening to the largely indigenous and subsistence oriented communities that provide that human face um, to the Arctic. Me, you know, many of our communities are tiny, they're very small. They range from 200 to the largest one in Nunavut is Iqaluit, uh, which is about 9,000. And so we don't always necessarily have the uh, great political power or influence in, at the national and international levels, but our communities are the heart and soul of the Arctic. And Inuit culture is, uh, you know, very challenging in, in moments where they're challenging, but it's within those challenges of our hunting culture that we really bring in the ability for our children to learn about themselves. As I say, developing their character skills is a very important part of this, and it's a very holistic way in which we teach our children to survive the land. And those skills, as I say, and I repeat because it's really important for people to get this, is that that wisdom that we teach our children which is very often sourced from that ice and snow and the cold and the land, is equally now at stake as being lost as the ice itself. And that's the connection that people have to understand. Our environment and climate were predictable. They were rich in lessons, allowing our ingenious culture through traditional knowledge to be passed down generation to generation 
However, all these things are changing today. Globalization has hit the Arctic uh, very rapidly. And as the ice melts, the wisdom it has taught us threatens to disappear along with it. Everything is connected through our common atmosphere, not to mention our common spirit and our humanity. And what affects another affects us all. And so as the Arctic melts, you can't get clearer than that in terms of understanding as the Arctic melts, because what's happening in the Arctic does not stay in the Arctic. It is impacting everywhere else in the world as the ice melts, as Greenland, the ice sheet that's on land melts, it's creating a sea level rise in many other places in the world. And as we speak, the small island developing states are being relocated to other larger islands. <clears throat> Alaska is being hit the hardest of all the Inuit homelands that we live in. Kavalina, Shishmarov, Nutak. All these communities are now struggling enormously because of the changes that are happening. The Arctic is that cooling system. It is the air conditioner, if you will, for the planet. And it is breaking down. And it is creating havoc with the ocean currents, the warming of the oceans. And the oceans, this is my grandson when he was little, hunting with his father on the boat. And so, all of these changes are causing what we see today, even in this own country, the wildfires, the floods, the um, intense hurricanes in the south, tornadoes, you name it. It's all happening as a result of the breakdown of that air conditioner of our planet, which is the Arctic's ice and glaciers and the ice sheet of Greenland. So we are all connected. It's all there. So the world that I knew and the world that my grandsons, I now have two, another little one who's six, and this boy is now 22. Um, and I thought of him so much last night as we had, you had the young um, singer, because my son is a rap singer as well. And, uh, and that's his way of expressing what he goes through. And he has lost in the last couple of years very close friends to suicide. And so that is his way also of uh, expressing what they go through in that generation. And so the world that I knew and the world that my grandsons will inherit <clears throat> is changing very rapidly. As I say, it's not in the Arctic, it's not just an environmental issue with unwelcome economic consequences. It's really a matter of health, a matter of livelihood, food, and individual and cultural survival. It is a human health issue affecting our children, our families, our communities. The Arctic is not wilderness or a frontier waiting to once again be exploited, although as I speak, it is being explored and exploited as a result of the ice that's melting. But it is our home, it is our homeland. And all of these challenge challenges that we're facing are not necessarily of our doing. We have benefited the least from industry, and yet we are the most disproportionately negatively impacted by the effects of globalization. How, how very ironic and sad that a people who have lived sustainably for millennia and far from the sources of pollutants and greenhouse gases would bear the brunt of their damaging effects. Think about that. For too long, we've asked the world to stop bringing harm to a way of life of an entire people, and the response has been, it's too expensive for us to stop doing business as usual. So Inuit are being asked to pay the price for the unsustainable choices most of the world continues to want to maintain. And Inuit are becoming, in fact, the collateral damage as a result of irresponsible political actions, or perhaps I should say inactions. So everyone benefits from a frozen Arctic, and that everything is connected, and that we can no longer separate the importance and value of the Arctic from the sustainable growth of economies around the world. So I believe, I still believe, and I, I plug this in everywhere I go, the power of a human rights-based approach is 
what we can move this uh, discussion out of the realm of a dry economic and technical debate that often and still does overtakes discussions on so many levels. So a human rights approach takes that path of principle, showing us that fundamental change is not just sound policy, but an ethical imperative. imperative. And I've seen that approach um, in my global work, work in terms of connecting to people, connecting to the audiences, connecting to civil society, connecting to those who work on the ground with people with, in terms of health, in terms of education, social, all these issues. And so I saw how the world enthusiastically connected to and welcomed our work on making that connection. And why? Because people can relate to this issue when we bring it to the human dimension. We don't just leave it to politicians and economists to deal with, but when you bring it to that level, then we all have a sense of connection to the issue and we all can do something about it in the roles and the, the work that we do. So again, defending, and this is a plug for my book here, defending the right to be cold is really about connectivity and that we're all connected by this fundamental human right and that the Inuit right to be cold is connected to everyone's right to a healthy environment. And so a right which requires the world's focus and attention and care in defending it at all levels in, in the work that we do. And so when I <clears throat> decided to write the book, and I'm going to, to uh, borrow a line from uh, Maya Angelou in a minute here, it was important for me to relay the, or, or put into context the problems and the social challenges that we face in our community, so that younger generation that is taking their lives in very high numbers in our communities can start to understand perhaps the context better of why we struggle and not take it so personally. And I had hoped that the book and the way in which I tried to write it in a very human way, in a very personal journey way, would allow for that younger generation to better understand that context and help. And I had hoped to alleviate a little bit of the burden that that generation carry from the historical traumas and all of the things that have happened to us. And, and throughout this work, I'm always very honored that I have been honored and, and you know, humbled by the, the way in which the world has wanted to decorate me for the work that I do. But it was important also from that place of honor for me to share and to take that line from Maya Angelou to say that everyone knows my glory, but they don't know my story. And so it was important for me to share that story, that personal human story in my book, so to allow for that younger generation to understand it, but also for the world to understand that as Inuit, we just don't want to be going down in the history of globalization as victims to modernity and to the world that has come to our, our doorstep so quickly. So we have lived a very close-knit community throughout my life and it, where everything mattered and everything was connected and that, in a sense, was kind of like magic in the way that I grew up, not in a fairy tale kind of way, but in a way where we were just so connected to one another, to our environment, to our culture, and we prepared our children for the opportunities and the challenges of life in a very powerful, holistic way. And so um, that the, not only with the tumultuous changes, but all of what's happening with climate change and bringing food insecurity, all of those issues are now impacting us. And as I said earlier, we protect, uh, or, or we, we, hunting is not just a sport for us. For us, it's we're protecting what we love. And it's my messaging has been to try to tell the world, fall back in love with nature, fall back in love with our planet, and we can do this all together. And so I've learned through the many talks that I give across the country that very few people in Canada know about the historical traumas and all that has happened in our world to make this um, the, the challenging uh, statistics that you see every day in the newspaper and on TV and radio. So we know that 
uh, culture suppression and oppression has diminished our identity, our sense of self-worth and that control over our lives as I mentioned earlier. And addictions and violence are symptoms of the traumas that have been endured. I was 18 when we had our first suicide in my own community. Now we can't even keep up with the numbers. I have lost four grand nephews in three years to suicide. This is very real for us in our communities. And so we are trying to find ways in which to really address these issues and make land-based solutions be the way in which we can help those at risk. And many more people are working really hard on the ground to find the solutions to the epidemic that is happening in our communities. So. Um, There's always an outpouring of support when there is emergencies happening, you know, the floods, the fires, all of those situations across our country. And that's who we are, that we, you know, we're Canadians, we help one another. And uh, the level of support is just so remarkable that happens when that happens in all of these communities that are being impacted by the sudden emergencies that are happening as a result of these floods and fires and droughts and so on. But imagine that level, the equal level, the equivalent level of emergency every single day without end where you feel a loss of what is happening around you. Imagine no drinking water, not for a week or two, but for decades in many of our First Nations communities. Imagine that we were being poisoned from afar where our mothers had to think twice about nursing their babies as a result of toxins in our food chain. Imagine women missing for not for a year or a month, or, but for decades with no explanation. And the constant worry that your children are at high risk of self-destruction due to those intergenerational traumas of legacy and the structural racism that continues to plague our communities. What would, you, what would that be like? What if that state of emergency became the new norm? What kind of psychological impact might that have on your people, on your community? and a history of that violence of our community is now mirroring the violence that we inflict upon our planet. So we have to understand that human trauma and planet trauma are one of the same. I understand that the economy is volatile and growing the econ but growing it in the same way in the same unsustainable way causes irreparable damage to the atmosphere and it's forcing the planet to react with violent storms and other erratic behavior. This is not unlike the child, and this is, can be your takeaway today, this is not unlike the child who has suffered trauma. Without care, a space to heal, and effective coping mechanisms, self-destructive behavior is inevitable. What we're seeing in our communities and in our atmosphere are not abnormal behaviors. What we're seeing are perfectly normal reactions to extremely abnormal circumstances. And that's the connection. Human trauma, planet trauma, one of the same. And so climate change is happening now. The Arctic is very impacted. And we need to address these issues from a human perspective. So we can't think our way out of this. I don't know if the movement will be totally in politics. We know now we're in, you know, in the campaign mode and all of the promises that are being made once again. But it really is up to us where, what, what in whatever we do, the influences. Don't underestimate the influence that you can have on this issue, the larger issue. It really is about how we do things in our world, in our homes, in our communities, in the workplace, and, and the, the purposeful work that in particularly in the health field that all of you are in is really um, has the potential to do a lot. So don't ever underestimate that you can be part of the global solution in what you do and how you do it. And so, we have tried politics, economy, um, and we need to 
uh, I think, reassure society that change will not punish economy, but rather provide an opportunity for us to flourish in the future. And if we truly want to reconcile as citizens of the world and uh, as a common humanity and in our own country here, I think we need to feel our way through this crisis to discover once again that everything matters and everything is connected. And, and again, as I said, kind of go back to that magic I spoke about it described in my youth. Again, not as a, you know, Disney kind of feeling, magical, but one that connects us all, that respects all living things, because I think when we all come together, we can do so much. Now, there's a lot more that needs to be done in our communities. <clears throat> there's a lot more we need to do in terms of getting people to really go out there in nature and start to embrace it once again. <clears throat> because as someone once said to me not so long ago, and I thought, wow, this is really the, the key words here, is that so many around the world, the reason why we're debating this issue in the first place with climate change is that we've become disconnected to our environment, to our food source, and to each other. In fact, many people are suffering what this person said is called nature deficit disorder. And so we need to go back to the places. I don't say you have to become a hunter or, or a fisherman or a gatherer, but just to know what is happening to our planet. Because when you're living in an urban setting, it's easy to disconnect and think, oh, well, you know, I'm still in my shorts in November. It's not a, such a bad thing. But it's a very troubling thing, and it's to understand the larger picture of what's happening. And of course, in our own, you know, it's not just in terms of the, the, um, the climate change issues. Look at what's happening in some of our communities and the tuberculosis uh, is, that is back. I mean, what is it in Canada that a 15-year-old girl two years ago would die of TB? You know, these are very serious things that are still happening in our communities. And that m parents and mothers are still trying to find where their children or their families or loved ones were buried 50 years ago. And a mother just found her child not so long ago where she was buried, who had been sent away for TB 50 years ago. The suicides, as I say, that are an epidemic in our communities, and certainly in my region of Nunavik, they are. And so the history of trauma that has to be better understood. I was once in, in two years ago after my book came out, I was in, um, New, Ze uh, in Austra New Zealand and Australia for a book festival. Three authors, three Canadian authors were sent down. And I was on a panel with Tim Flannery, who happens to be one of the world's greatest climatologists. He has many, many books. Great guy. Very smart. And he knows the issues well from that scientific perspective as well. We were on a panel together, and he was asked, an audience member at the end of our talk, we know what's happening to our planet. We know it's mainly man-made. What is it about us in this world that is preventing us from taking urgent action to address this issue? What are we lacking? And his response was, Imagination. Imagination. Imagining we can do this differently. Imagining we can create businesses and institutions and policies differently. So imagine we must to change our attitudes, our approaches. And I thought that was pretty darn good in terms of how we can just shift things on our daily basis, and it can happen now. We don't have to wait for others to change how we imagine a different world. And if we can collectively come to those places, we will be able to make those changes. Another wonderful elder from New Brunswick that I'm working with on, with foundations on trying to develop land-based uh, healing solutions, said we also need to develop mother-based systems more and more, and I believe that. And that's why she's up here right now. <laughs> and so, and our food, our wonderful food that we <coughs> rely on. So, um, in closing, I want to, uh, I think I've, my timing is not too badly. <laughs> Good. Um, in closing, I want to um, 
Before I do that, though, I want to be able to, to say that the nutritional value, the cultural value, the emotional value, and the spiritual value, the communal value, and the medicinal value of our country food is just a powerful place for us. And we need to uh, continue, and I, and I think so. we were talking about this last night very briefly about how um, country food is, is part of medicine for us now and that we need to uh, continue to explore the ways in which we can help patients and those in healthcare to have more access to country food. And I was recently in Toronto um, at a health um, food nourish conference where I also delivered the keynote and there are people, indigenous women, an indigenous hunter already doing some of that and it's remarkable how we can look to our culture and our food to help bring us back up into healthy states, not just physically, but as I say, culturally, emotionally, spiritually. And uh, I have a little um, six-year-old autistic spectrum grandson who's, um, as they call it, they used to call it Asperger's, whose grounding is our country food. His emotions will be all over the place, but the moment you give him mattaq, or nikuk, or any of our country food, he's grounded immediately within 20 minutes. And so we can never undervalue the importance of our cultural food, our country food, in all that we are in, uh, whether it's our children or whether it's those who are in the health systems. So I want to, to end with something on leadership that I was teaching <clears throat> at Bowdoin College in Maine in 2009 and after, the year after I went on to Mount Allison University and taught for a year uh, the human dimension to climate change. But while I was away, I had moved away from Iqaluit. I lived in Iqaluit, Nunavut for 15 years before moving back to my home town just uh, over two years ago of Kujuak in Nunavik. And, but while I was at Bowdoin College, there was a wonderful Inuit women's conference that was being organized in Iqaluit in Nunavut by many p women that I know and, um, and have lived and worked with and, and, and um, connected with while I was in Nunavut. And they um, said, you know, you're far away, you're not home, but we want your voice to come in to this conference that we're holding. And if you could be videotaped from Maine, where you are, uh, we would show your, your message but because we have a specific question for you uh, that we'd like you to answer along with a few others. Uh, would you be willing to do that? And so I'm in Nunavut, you know, I, I've lived in Nunavut where there's not one tree uh, and now I'm, I was in Maine amongst all these huge trees and I was being filmed with the question on leadership what, and the question was, what does leadership mean to you? And so I said, uh, sure, let's do it. And so along with uh, a few things that I did say on the video, this is what I said about, about leadership. Leadership to me means to never lose sight of the fact that the issues at hand are much bigger than oneself. Leadership is about working from a principled and ethical place within oneself and it is to model authentically, genuinely, for others, a sense of calm, a sense of clarity, and a sense of focus. Leadership is to always check inward, to ensure one is leading from a position of strength, not fear or victimhood, so one does not project one's own limitations onto those you are modeling possibilities for. So with that, thank you for having me. Thank you very much for the gift of your time today. 
We have a few moments for questions, if you are so willing. Mm -hmm. Thank yeah. you for that. There are some microphones that are set up within the big room. It's difficult for me to see. I think I see someone at number three, yep. Marty. Koyanamek, Sheila. Now time ago? Nani. Takunangi nama. <laughs> oh, okay, there's a light right above you, so I oh, can't see you. <laughs> it's heaven shining on me. <laughs> My name's Marty, uh, and I can't think of a better uh, speaker for a conference called Health Connections than what you've shared with us. Uh, you've shared the notion of uh, a connection between global warming and, uh, and the culture and strength of the people who live in the north. Um, in my few years of living in a Glulik, one of the things that touched me even more than the cold and the landscape and the animals were the social connections that exist in Inuit communities and, and still are part of my world today. I wonder if you have comments about uh, the role of Inuit youth. Um, I mean, we saw an Inuit youth uh, on the missing and murdered uh, women's, indigenous women's uh, work over the past few years, and we're seeing Inuit youth in films around the world. Uh, what's your optimistic view on the role of youth, Inuit youth, um, in solving some of our world problems in the years ahead? Mm -hmm. Wonderful question. And I, you know, I was looking at some of my notes at the end, and, I, and, and it's prompted me now to, to, to share some of what's working in our communities in terms of uh, our youth, and that is so bright there. Um, there's, there's a remarkable, as a, in parallel to the challenges that we're faced with, there's a remarkable movement within our own world with a lot of the younger generation that either really uh, were balanced in, as I said you know, earlier on about who had the traditional upbringing um, and who learned a lot about themselves while they were there, are the ones that are really making it because it isn't either or. We're not saying that we need to be in our traditional way and only be there, but it's really about what you get from the traditional upbringing and bringing that to the modern world. And so the kids that really were raised in that traditional way uh, with their parents are the ones that are really making headway and surviving the odds of the social and health problems. And so we have remarkable movement of the younger generation, in particularly I think the, the ones that are in their late 20s and 30s are really starting to step up and do some wonderful work. Uh, the plug I always do uh, for uh, our communities is if you haven't seen the documentary by Alethea from Iqaluit, she's one of our own in Nunavut, uh, called The Angry Inuk. Inuk is singular. Have you seen it? Yeah, it's remarkable. Um, if you haven't seen it, I would highly recommend it. It's, it's really on the, on the angle of animal rights movements, but boy, it's so well researched. It, is a, it gives you a much deeper understanding of what we're up against in terms of trying to find a sustainable world for our world. And it's very well done, and, and Alethea is a pro at documentary uh, filmmaking. And if you haven't seen The Grizzlies, you must go and see that movie. Again, produced um, and, and directed, you know, Alethea and Stacy McDonald were very, very involved in that. They're from Iqaluit as well. Well, Stacy's from Khulukdo. So there's a movement in, in amongst our youth that are really trying to make a mark in trying to get better communication out there to the world on what's happening. And we also have remarkable young people who are in performing arts and who are making a mark around the world on getting um, that better understanding through art, through music, through remarkable seamstress. I mean, we have a seamstress from Nunavut who was in Paris the other day on the, the runways of Paris with sealskin products. You know, it's remarkable what can be done. We also have... Um, you know, in, in a, the, the conservation economies that are starting to come up in terms of, and one of them, she may not be 20 or 30, but Sandra Inutik, who has been the chief negotiator working with the federal government here in Ottawa on creating conservation economies 
in on Baffin Island where you have a protected area. It was in the Globe and Mail. I'm not here to talk about the details of it because it's not my place to really to do so. But you can certainly find out more about that in terms of rather than just trying to find the land to dig up, you know, with mining industries and oil and gas, that is really going to just add to the problems that we face, not just in our homeland, but also the global emissions. We are now starting to explore and negotiate uh, on how to develop conservation economies where hunters can be paid to protect and guard our protected areas of the Arctic. These are creative and innovative ways. And that's what I mean by our imagination has to expand. We've got to, you know, uh, think of other ways in which we can create economies that don't destroy our land and add to the global emissions. And so we have this younger generation that are starting to really step up to the plate. And, um, and it gives me that a remarkable hope that this is going to happen, but not just in our world, but the world. I mean, if you know about Greta Thunberg, the young 16, 15, 16 year old Swedish girl who has just mobilized the younger generation across Europe and beyond to address these issues, it's very encouraging. And so yes, the youth movement I think is going to be the way. You are the change agents. I was in Paris uh, two weeks ago because my book has now been translated into French. And uh, yeah. <clears throat> I was invited to a music festival, but on the sidelines they were having um, talks, speakers come in from different parts of the world to speak to audiences that were coming. There were 80,000 people coming in for, you know, over the weekend to address um, or, or to, to, to come to these music festivals. And um, they said, well, while you're here, and we did the interview with the Le Monde, the, the, the biggest newspaper in France, and we did that interview for about 40 minutes or so. But while I was there, they said, listen, we're trying to get speakers to come and speak to the youth that are coming here for the big concerts. There's a techno concert occurring in about two hours. Would you be able to come and speak three minutes and have them do a call to action to this group of, you know, psyched up youth of France? And I went, okay, this is different. <laughs> this is different, but yes. Why, why, why? Yes, of course, I'll take that, seize that opportunity. And so uh, I'm being, you know, carted around on this little cart. It was 32 degrees that day, and, in, and I'm wearing my sila pa, and, and, uh, and off I go, and I'm going up the, walking up the, <laughs> walking up the, because I've never done a concert thingy right before, and so I'm walking up the thing, and all I could think of was Bohemian Rhapsody, you know, and he's going up the, those stairs, and I'm going, oh my God, is your spirit with me here, Freddie? And so anyway, so I go, so I go there, and, I'm in, and I didn't realize until I got in front, and there's there are thousands, thousands of these kids, and I thought, okay, I've got to seize this moment. This is different, but I've got to seize it. And so I was introduced and I went out and, I, and my question was, will they understand English enough to understand what I'm going to say? Because I don't really speak French. But I went out there and, and you know, half the things I don't remember what I said, but I must say it was about it condensing. The Arctic is melting. This is your planet. This is your time. And, and this is what we need to do. It's not just about politics or economics, it's about us. And the cheering that happened and they understood everything was one of those moments I'm still reflecting on because it is their open-heartedness, their open-mindedness, you know, and, and they, of course they were psyched up to, to, to be hearing us um, a um, techno concert, that was helpful, you know, but at the same time, it was just one of those p times where I said, I could feel in that moment, this is it. This is the youth. This is, the, the, this is what is going to be replicated throughout the world, is that the youth are going to say, yes, this is our ha future, this is in our hands, and we're going to make the changes, and that includes in our communities the movement that is starting with the youth that are going beyond, you know, and, and learning about themselves and embracing who they are as Inuit and, and as indigenous youth of this community, including the young man last night with his message. 
you know, singing and, and putting it all into context with the video that he had and that the kids that are in university today that are trying to make a change and, and the reconciliation that's going to happen and how they're going to stand up and they already are is going to be the way in which we can do this. And that hope is what gives me that hope to take action and to continue to speak to all of you across this country and beyond. So absolutely, they are, they are the answer to many of these uh, issues. <clears throat> one, more one more? One more, yeah. Hi, good morning. Mm -hmm. um, I enjoyed your speech. Um, so my question surrounds, um, I guess, political will. So you mentioned that like many people in Canada do not know about indigenous history or trauma. And um, if we understand the history, how um, coloniza colonization works, um, nations who are guilty of it, they have a vested interest not to really put that in their curriculums, especially yeah. when it comes to educating yeah. the youth. Mm -hmm. So, and then we, we've seen that with um, the Ford's government's attack on the education, um, the indigenous curriculum that the liberals um, introduced just before they lost the election. So I guess my question surrounds um, if politicians depend on a population with low political and social justice IQs to win elections, um, how can we expect politicians to have a vested interest in educating the public about the climate crisis and indigenous drama when their very political survival depends on a population that know. doesn't know the facts but depends on political propaganda? Yes, I know. I know. That's the biggest challenge of our time, really, and that's why I think at the end of, of, of my talk I said, I don't know if the movement will be in politics, you know, really. Um, and that's not being pessimistic for the sake of being pessimistic. It's really from the, uh, the historical context of how these things happen because, you know, we had remarkable hopes, you know. we had remarkable hopes that there would be a huge shift in all of these situations, not just in terms of climate change, but the indigenous communities and all of, uh, all of what we are challenged with, that things would really change. Um, so I think if we focus only on that, then we are expect, expending some of our energy on something that might not be fast moving to make those changes. And that's why I always say, rely on ourselves connect with one another, what, what, whatever it is that we do. It's not to say that we shouldn't be trying to vote in the right people, the right leaders, because it does require policy changes for sure. And it requires that partnership with government to be able to negotiate all kinds of things on so many levels. There's no doubt that that working relationship has to be there. But if we rely only on that, then I don't think we will get very far very quickly. You know, the culture of politics is one that's very difficult to deal with. I came two hairs from running in the last election, and I had to think very deeply about whether I wanted to do that, because I knew what it was like in when I was elected for 11 years representing our people at the international level, how difficult things can be and how you have to stand on principle so strongly not to lose your sense of self in that system. And I can imagine the fed, provincial and federal systems are 10 times worse than what I went through uh, 11 years ago. And the case in point is what's been happening in our own country recently, and we all know what that is in terms of women standing up on principle. And so we need to, I think, think about how we can do this, yes, by voting the right leaders as much as we can, who will make that difference. We, also, we know now who some of them are. Um, that we need to, to keep supporting, but we also have to think in terms of what we can do in spite of or despite politics in our world. And once you start to learn about our interconnections with people of the Arctic or with indigenous peoples in our country, you know, we are a people who don't need to be saved. We don't want that. We don't need that. That's not been helpful in the history of colonization. Um, but what we do need are equal partnerships who understand what's going on and who can lead at every level of this room 
and become leaders in that change with or without politics. And so that's been my messaging, is learn more about what's happening in our indigenous communities of this country, in the Arctic, and we can help guide to navigate what these issues are. We know a little bit about sustainability. We've had to, living in the conditions and the environment that we live in. So you can use us to help you to navigate what needs to be done, not the other way around, where we have to be told what needs to be done. We can help lead in those areas. And so it's about changing and reimagining and realigning the way we do things. And that's what I meant earlier, imagination. Imagine that we can do this differently. And that's my end message, really. I hope that answers your question. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.